Hi, this is Ben Jariola, and welcome to Coders Cult. This is PHP Training Webinar 001, uh, which will tackle PHP, MySQL, HTML, and CSS, and all their roles and relationships. It is now February 13, uh, February 15, I'm sorry, 2013 at 11 a.m. Pacific Time. It's 2 p.m. Eastern. It's 3 a.m. Hong Kong, Taipei, and Manila. Uh, this webinar occurs twice a month, running every other week, and we will be looking at times to make this more convenient to everyone around the world. So we might be changing the time period on the second session, and we'll be informing you all about the, uh, what time that would be uh, later on. This webinars, these webinars are recorded, so if ever you registered and could not make it, you can watch the recorded sessions online. Uh, you will just have to go to CurtisCult.com and with your registration info and you should be able to see the recorded webinars in the future. The value of attending the live webinars is for you to interact with the live Q&A sessions where you get those instant answers directly from us. Now, just a, a brief background, you know, not everyone is created equal. Some of you are beginners, some of you are no more than the basics. But since we want everyone to learn and not scare the newbies, uh, we will start at the very beginning, but this will continue to progress in the coming weeks as we uh, go into more advanced topics. So, uh, for this webinar, uh, all questions will be directed to Twitter. If you are not familiar with Twitter, you could simply go to twitter.com uh, and register and start following Coders Cult. And whenever you have a question specifically for this webinar, just use the hashtag PHP training. If you are not familiar with uh, Twitter, just type in the pound symbol, the pound number sign or sharp symbol and add PHP training. Along with that is your question. Uh, just to get a good idea of how many are viewing this this uh, uh, webinar right now uh, on the current webinar URL. Maybe you could just say hi or something using the hashtag. Okay. So moving forward. So this online training is sponsored by Wishlist Member, IMI, Internet Marketing Inc., and LearnPHP.com. Wishlist Member is a powerful yet easy to use membership solution that can turn any WordPress blog into a full blown uh, membership site. They are trusted over by over 43,000 online communities and membership sites worldwide. Internet Marketing Inc. is a full-service digital marketing agency offering SEO, PPC, social media, community development, marketing, contextual behavior, and retargeted display ads, email marketing, web design, and development. We are listed as on Inc. 500 as the 185th fastest growing company in the United States and fourth in San Diego. LearnPHP.co is an online video training community for a beginner PHP coders. LearnPHP.co aims to help PHP coders get past the initial learning curve, gain confidence in their ability to master PHP, and give them the roadmap for the rest of their learning journey. Okay, so today, who's going to present uh, more on this, the PHP training would be Mike Lopez. So we're going to focus more on him than uh, the other cult masters where I have myself, Ben Jariola, and also John Morris. So Mike Lopez, he has tons of years in web development. I have worked with him in the past on several projects um, during the late 90s, and we have evolved from old school. I still remember the years where we started out in old school HTML script that turned into PHP script, and we moved on to PHP MySQL. That was already like 99 or so, 97, 98, 99. Uh, and he has worked on many uh, different uh, projects, web development projects in the entertainment industry, communication, real estate, internet marketing. And the time when he decided to join Wishlist Products team, he became the lead developer and architect of the very popular WordPress plugin, Wishlist Member. Now, five years later, uh, he is now leading the Wishlist development team and taking Wishlist Member to entirely new levels. So from this point, uh, I pass it on to Mike and take it away. Thank you very much, Benj, for the cool introduction. And um, I would also like to 
thank Jamo, uh, John Morris, my good old friend in Wishless Products for also coming and helping us today with the Q&A. So, as, uh, as Ben mentioned, today we're going to talk about the relationship of PHP, MySQL, HTML, and CSS in modern website development. And that's the whole goal. So as we do that, I would like to encourage you not to worry about the code itself. Don't worry if you don't understand any of the code that you see on screen, because we are not going to focus on that. We are actually just going to focus on the relationship of each technology that we are using to develop a website. OK, so that said, let's just see how the web works, OK? So typically, the user, OK, it could be you, your mom, anybody, would log onto their computer, open their browser, and then type in a URL, OK? So they might type in Facebook or Google or um, coderscult.com, OK? So when they do that, what the browser does is it checks the URL, sends it to the server, OK? It sends the request to a server. So then now the server, after receiving the request, would run different things, different stuff uh, in it to actually return the proper response to the browser. And part of those things that the server does is to run PHP and MySQL, OK? So it runs PHP and MySQL to do the computation, to do the processing, to do the data handling and everything. And then PHP would now respond to the browser with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, OK? So as you can see, PHP runs on the server. MySQL runs on the server. It then generates the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript, which it sends back to the browser. <laughs> OK, sorry. OK? Now, which is sent back to the browser. And at this point, the browser now parses the returned HTML, CSS, and JavaScript and displays the proper output to the user. OK, so to, re to recap that, the user types in a URL uh, the, uh, on a browser. The browser sends a request to the server. The server does its thing, runs PHP and MySQL, which then responds to the browser with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript a language that the browser itself understands. The browser now runs the HTML, the CSS, and the JavaScript to display the final output to the user, OK? OK, now let's look at this table over here, which um, shows each of the, pro sorry, each of the language uh, that we are using in a website and how, uh, how it runs and where it runs and what the roles are. HTML handles the content and the structure, like text, images, tables, forms, and everything that you see in your browser that, that's, being, that's being handled by HTML, that runs on your browser, OK? CSS, on the other hand, handles style and presentation. We will see that later on. It's, it handles colors, fonts, background, and everything else that has to do with style and presentation. That, too, runs in the browser. Then we have JavaScript. JavaScript is not necessarily required in website development, but most modern websites use JavaScript, especially um, you've, probably, you've probably already heard uh, the, the terms jQuery or prototype and uh, different things like that. What, happened, what, what it does is that it handles client-side scripting. It's actually a programming language, so what it can do is that it could, usually it's being used to generate dynamic user interaction, pop-ups, form validation, and the like. Again. The JavaScript, together with HTML and CSS, also runs in the browser. Then, on the server side, we have PHP, which is a server-side scripting, as opposed to JavaScript, which is a client-side scripting. PHP runs on the server. It handles server-side logic, data processing, and most of the heavy lifting on the server side. Because um, if, if those are done on the browser side, most of the time, people's computers would bog down. So that's, the, that's, that's why. It has to run on the server. And then MySQL handles data management. So this is your database. Okay, it, stores, it stores all sorts of data needed by a website, like your posts, your user information. Your, in Facebook, it stores your likes and your comments and everything. That's what MySQL does. It stores all of those information. So to recap this particular page, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript all run in the browser. And PHP and MySQL runs on the server. Okay, so 
that said, I think it's about time for us to check out some code, okay? And uh, we're not going to do any programming. I just want to show you the different aspects of each of the language that we mentioned, okay? So let's start out with HTML, okay? HTML, what you can see right now on the page or on the screen is um, HTML code, okay? I'll highlight that. All of this is HTML. None of this is CSS. None of this is JavaScript or PHP or MySQL. This is pure HTML. And um, you can see that um, it, it defines the title of the page, it defines your headers, or your taglines, and everything. And that is the code that the browser receives. And when it actually parses that and uh, generates the output, you will see something like this. Okay, so you'd see here that I've, I've put in my header, I've put on uh, this, the, the tagline, I've hard-coded the date. Okay, when I say hard-coded, I typed it manually inside HTML. So now I say that it's December 25, 2012, which is obviously wrong because it's hard-coded. And if, edit, if uh, I want to update that, all I have to do is go into the source code and edit that manually. Okay, later on you would see how easy it is to change that using uh, the technologies that we're going to talk about. I have your question, what is 2 plus 3? Okay, if I refresh the page, it doesn't really care. HTML would return, sorry about that, HTML would return the same question over and over again, again, because it is hard-coded. It's what we call static. It does not change. And then I have a form. Your answer is, I type 7, which is wrong. I check my answer, and I don't get any feedback from that, because HTML cannot handle that as well, okay? So that's HTML. It's good. It's good for putting up your text on, on, on the internet. It's good for putting up your pictures and everything um, and things like this, but it cannot do anything more than that, okay? So during development, as you can see, this particular page doesn't look any good at all. I mean, I haven't designed any borders or colors and everything, and that's where CSS comes in, okay? This is the source code now with each of uh, the source code that we previously looked at, but with CSS included, okay? Anything that you see inside what we call a style block is a CSS, um, oh, sorry, it's CSS itself. So here we define the padding, the font, we define um, the, the width, the margin, and anything else that has to do with the presentation of the page. So you can see that I defined that the width of the page has to be 600 pixels, that um, the padding, that the font size has to be 9 points, and so on and so forth. And together with that, we also insert some stuff within the HTML code itself, like we specify class names now, okay? This one is the container. We have the class name here for the header, the class name for the content. And what, what it does is that it defines which section of your HTML code would uh, the styles be applied to. So anything that's inside the container here would be applied to this div tag, which has the container class. Okay, so if at this point you're getting confused, please don't worry at the moment, okay? What we are just doing right now is just um, establishing the framework, or sorry, the, the foundation of how the web works, okay? So don't worry about the code yet. Just, just, try, to, just try to separate what each language does uh, for websites. So now that we have applied styles, the output now changes to this one. You would see that I have now a border for my header. Yeah, I admit this is not a really good design. I'm not a designer, but it shows that with CSS, you can define borders, you can define colors, alignments, and uh, a lot of different things, as opposed to the output of HTML, which is nothing more than just, you know, it almost looks like a very plain um, document written in a word processor, okay? Now, CSS adds style to that, adds beauty to it, but it is still static, okay? It's still static. It's still, um, it still doesn't give you any feedback at all, okay? Everything is still hard-coded, and that's where JavaScript can come in, okay? So I'll give you uh, some examples for JavaScript. So with JavaScript, what it could do um, is that for, for, our, uh, for, for this demo, we're going to show how JavaScript can be used to validate um, form input, okay? So this, if the one on top here is called the style block, 
The one inside the script is called the JavaScript or the script block. Okay, here's where I put my function names. This is um, this a function is a JavaScript term for, or actually a programming term for a group of commands that you want to let the computer do. Okay, so say here I have a function which is called validate answer. Okay, then down in my form I add some additional um, parameters to my form. It says, okay, if the form has been submitted, I want you to validate the answer first. Okay, so let's try that out in our um, output. Okay, in our demo. So here I go. What is two plus three? Say if I type one, it would actually tell me your answer has to be a number from two to twenty. The reason for that you would see later on because I'm adding two numbers here, uh, two single-digit numbers. So the numbers has to be between 2 and, oh, sorry, from 2 to 20 only. So if I type 21, it would give me the same message. So this, um, oh, I'm not even sure if you're seeing this, but it's actually showing a pop-up window that tells me that um, the answer is not valid. It has to be between 2 and 20, okay? But then if I type uh, a number that's valid, then it would actually submit the form. But still, I'm not doing any computation, although I could actually do computation in JavaScript already. Okay? So, um, that's what JavaScript does. It's a powerful scripting language, and um, you've probably seen it uh, on different websites where it gives you instant feedback, where um, you'd see drop downs or light boxes and stuff like that. Those are mostly run by JavaScript combined with HTML and CSS. Okay? So now let's move on to the server side, okay? Let's move on to the server side. This is where all the heavy lifting is being done. PHP, I've heard people say that I want to be a PHP developer or I am a PHP programmer or I know PHP, but they actually are not really sure what they're talking about. Why is that? Because they think that PHP is everything, okay? Truth is, PHP is just a part of website development. So in this case, you would see that um, uh, before I show you the code, let me just show you the output first, okay? Here, you would see that the date says, that it now says that the date is February 16, okay? Why does it say February 16? Because I'm in the Philippines right now, and it's actually already February 16 here. We're way advanced than the other countries in terms of time. Now, uh, you would see that the question, what is five plus two, if I refresh the page, actually changes now, okay? So it's now what is six plus five? I refresh the page again, what is three plus nine? So I now get more dynamic content with PHP, okay? And uh, if I actually answer that, say I answer 12, what is three plus nine equals 12, it will now tell me that my answer is correct. I now have user feedback. I now know what's actually happening to the data that I submitted in the form, okay? So let's try that again. What is 5 plus 7? If I answer 1, okay, JavaScript actually came in on that, said that um, uh, my answer is not between 2 and 20, so let me try answering with something that's wrong still. Let's me try answering, by 20, uh, answering with 20. Now, PHP tells me now that my answer is wrong, okay? So this is basic um, user feedback that uh, PHP can handle. It also, it's, it's also a good example of data processing what PHP could do with the data that you submitted in your form. Think of the form, think, uh, think of cases like um, user logins, okay? You type in your username and your password. It sends you to the server. PHP would now process that information and check if the login is valid. In, uh, imagine registration forms. Actually, when you registered for this webinar, you probably already went through that. You probably entered your name and your email address, and that's being handled in the back end by a server-side uh, server language like PHP. Okay, so that's what PHP does. And now looking at the source code, we would see that together with HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, I've added some, um, some PHP code in here, okay? Here's the part where it actually displays the current date, okay? Here's the part where it checks um, if I have not submitted anything to display the form. Here's the part, uh, it, this is also the part where it generates the random number. Okay, this is more and more getting complex. And, um, but again, I'm reminding you, don't worry about this for now. I'm just showing you what they all do. And this is the part where it checks for the answer itself, and it gives me the correct feedback, whether my answer is correct or wrong. Okay, so PHP could be used to do many things. Okay, 
Um, I, I can hardly imagine a website not using PHP or any other web scripting language on that matter. Okay, like ASP.NET, that's another language. Um, like Perl or other languages. All of those are similar to PHP in that they all run in the server, they process your data, and they, re and they return uh, information based on what has been submitted, okay? Or what needs to be displayed. So now let's move on to the final part, okay, which is MySQL. As mentioned earlier, MySQL is nothing more than a database. Although it is a very powerful database, it has its own language, which is called um, SQL, okay? L actually stands for language in that term, okay? Structured query language. So um, if, um, if without, without MySQL, a website would still run, but the data handling would be very, very ugly. Like imagine if you have 10,000 users or 10,000 blog posts and all of them are saved in a text file, okay? It would be very hard for the website to actually process that and return it to you. So what MySQL does is it organizes all of those stuff for you in a very, very easy to, uh, sorry, in a very, very easy to retrieve manner using its database system. So before you're looking at the source code again, let's look at the output first, okay? Here, you would see some names, okay? This is a table. I replaced the form now with the table. We have a column, first name, last name, email, the birthday. It displays the first name, the last name, the email, and the birthday as well. Okay, none of these birthdays are true except mine and Bench, and actually all the birthdays are true except for Tom, Tom's hack, okay? Um, so where does it get this, okay? Let's look at the source code. You would actually not see inside the source code those names, those birthdays, or everything. What happens in the source code is that first, PHP connects to MySQL, it's, it tells MySQL, okay, I want to connect to this database, and then it asks MySQL for all the information in a particular table, okay? I'll show you more about that later. Then after it retrieves all those information, it would now loop through each information that has been returned or loop through each row that has been returned by MySQL and display whatever is in there, like the first name, the last name, the email, the birthday, or whatever else it needs to be displayed, okay? So where does this get it. Where does MyS uh, MySQL and PHP get this information? Okay, I am right now showing you what I call a, um, a MySQL management tool. It's called Adminer, okay? We will talk more about this in the future as we do more MySQL stuff. So imagine MySQL as a spreadsheet program, okay? Like my Microsoft Excel or like OpenOffice, okay? It is a spreadsheet program. That's what MySQL is. A database is a file, okay, a spreadsheet file. And um, the, the tables, okay, are the spreadsheet, are, are the sheets under, uh, within each uh, spreadsheet file. Like you have, um, like you have, so sheet one, sheet two. So with MySQL, we have, you know, table names. So the database is PHP training, and the table name is sample users table. So if I select and I view the content of sample users table, I would see, oh, here they are, okay? I would see that the first name is in here, the last name is in here, and that's exactly what has been returned in our, uh, in our output using PHP and MySQL, okay? You would see that I could actually specify which uh, information to display. Like in this case, we have the ID in here, but I decided not to display the ID on my final output. Okay, because my PHP could decide which, which rows or which columns it should display. So let's see if this actually works by, say, deleting Tom's Hank. Oh, no, let's, just, let's not delete him. Let's just correct the name, okay? Tom Hanks. I don't know the birthday. <laughs> I don't know the email. Let's save that. Okay, it's now correct in our database. So if I refresh the page, I should actually see now a corrected name. So let's try that. Let's refresh it, and there you go. It now displays the correct name. So if I add another column in here, sorry, add another row. Um, I add, say, let's just say Santa. Okay, let's add Santa. Hopefully he's happy right now. Um, I wonder where his, when his birthday was. So let's just try that. December 25, 1901. 
Okay, he's now in the database, and um, I will try to retrieve that, or I will refresh the page now, and you would see that there you go, Santa is now there. If I delete anything in here, then that too will be deleted on my web page because there's nothing more to, to display on that particular person. Tom Hanks has been deleted. So that's what MySQL does, okay? It stores your information. PHP now talks with MySQL and says, okay, I want this information, give it to me. PHP decides what information is to display. Say, for example, okay, let's just do a quick demo here. Say, if I decide, oh, sorry, I can't edit this because it's a fixed page. If I decide not to display the first name, all I need to do is delete this line. Okay, if I decide not to display the email, all I need to do is delete the email line on the final output, which is being generated by PHP using HTML. And all of those is the only thing, are the only things that you would see. So again, MySQL handles the data. PHP grabs the data from MySQL. PHP also runs other things like check logins or you know um, do some data processing or computations on the server side. That returns it, okay? That returns it over to the server, oh, sorry, to the browser as HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, okay? Which is then finally rendered by the browser to the user, okay? So again, HTML runs on the browser, CSS runs on the browser, handles styles and presentation, JavaScript runs on the browser, usually used for user interaction, for validation. PHP runs on the server, okay? And um, it's usually used to handle uh, data processing and all the heavy lifting. And MySQL handles all the data. It also runs on the server. So if you need to do a website, you would actually need to use a combination of all these languages put together in order for you to create a web page like, you know, like a WordPress blog. All of those use PHP, HTML, CSS, um, JavaScript, and MySQL in the back end. Um, like uh, a even Blogger uses things like this, okay? Uh, CNN.com uses things like this. Google, Facebook uses things like this. So you need to learn all these different technologies in order to create a final working website, okay? A website without PHP nowadays is boring, okay? Uh, a website that is um, without MySQL would be pretty much useless because it's, there's not much data, okay? So um, if you have questions right now, I would like to encourage you to start posting your questions on Twitter using the hashtag PHP training, okay? That's use the pound sign, then PHP training. Then uh, we will monitor all those questions and we will answer them one by one as we go along. We will try to answer as many questions as possible, but please, please forgive us if we don't manage to answer whatever question you have. All right, so I'm putting back my dear friends, um, Benj and uh, John, on air. So Benj and John, if you could now please unmute yourselves, you're probably muted out. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yep. Loud Perfect. And Okay, uh, Mike, there's one question that came in here, and it's from Anne Haynes. I personally know Anne Haynes. I've worked with her before. She was actually my boss in the past. Uh, so her question, do PHP files become corrupt? Do PHP files become corrupt? Yes. Okay, um, any, anything on a computer can actually be corrupt. Okay, so um, most of the time, it's usually just the programmer's error. They type something wrong. Other, other times, it's um, the way you uploaded the file on the server. When you upload a file on the server, sometimes um, they uploaded it wrong. Sometimes the format of the uploading is wrong, and that usually also corrupts the PHP file. Although, basically, it's just a text file. Uh, it could still be corrupted. OK, I have another question here from Adonis Chico. Wow. Don Chico. <laughs> and uh, his question, is it correct to say that JavaScript can also compute values from a form? Yes, that is also correct. Um, say in my example earlier, um, wherein I did the computations using PHP, that could also be done using JavaScript without the, necess without the necessity of submitting the form over to the, um, over to the server. Okay. So simple things like that could actually be done um, using JavaScript. And I would actually encourage you guys 
if, if, if it could be done with JavaScript and it doesn't need any heavy data processing on the server side, just use JavaScript for that. But again, for our example today, I just use PHP so that you guys can see it. Uh, just a small follow-up question from Anne. Uh, can a file become corrupt just by opening the file? Oh, no. Not necessarily. I can't imagine a way um, for you to corrupt the file just by opening it unless you opened it, messed up with it, either intentionally or accidentally, and then saved it. That would corrupt the PHP file. Uh, uh, probably I could add also, it, it sure. may appear like the opening was the cause, but it, it, Mike is totally correct there. Um, another question from Alan Urizar. Uh, do you need to use WordPress.org? So I, I assume he's referring to the one that you download and not the one that you sign up on. Mm -hmm. Do you need to use WordPress to create a website, or is it just more easy to work with? Okay, that's a good question. Um, WordPress is a very powerful blogging software. It actually started as a blogging platform, but now it's, uh, it's now a CMS. It's a full-blown CMS used by many uh, different companies and uh, individuals to do things. So yeah, it is actually true that it's just easier to build a website using WordPress, but it is not entirely necessary at all. It's actually not necessary to use WordPress to build a website. It's just way easier. Um, maybe John here could add more to that because John here is very, very good in uh, creating themes for WordPress. John? <laughs> yep, can you hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, so I, I mean, when you were saying that, I was actually thinking that I might even want to jump in because I see actually, I get a quite, quite a few people who will ask me or, or mention about writing their own CMS. And oftentimes people, and again, when you're learning, it's fine, but people are more in love with the idea of writing their own CMS than they are of actually needing that CMS for what they're doing. In most cases, what you for what you're you're going to do something like WordPress or Joomla or Drupal or whatever is going to be just fine for what you need because you can do, you could really do all the things that you want to do if you wrote your own in a CMS like that. Um, it's just going to be all written for you and you don't have to recreate the wheel. So more often than not, I, I would say that probably using something like that is not only, you know, easier or whatever, but it would be the recommended path so you don't have to recode a bunch of things. And not only that, but any kind of proprietary system you might write isn't going to have the same kind of usage and testing that something like WordPress or one of the other CMSs would have. So it's definitely not required, but I would say for most projects, uh, you probably want to start with something like that and then and then build from there as opposed to trying to recreate the wheel. Um, uh, just to jump in, um, if ever the question is arriving to what is the use of PHP if I could use WordPress and WordPress is mid PHP, do I need to learn WordPress? Well, uh, does anyone want to answer my question or just continue? <laughs> yeah, go? go ahead. Go ahead, dude. <laughs> Okay. So um, basically, you know, uh, WordPress, of course, has its core functions, uh, and there may be some time where you want to do add some additional functions that is outside of its core functions. That's where you use plugins. Now, what if the plugin does not exist and you want to create your own plugin? Then that is when you need PHP yourself. Now. All of you on, on the webinar, maybe not all of you have a web development job. Maybe some of you are SEO people, some of you are content writers, some of you own your own blog, your own website, you're making money from it, and uh, probably you don't envision, envision your life to be a hardcore web developer, but or maybe you do aspire to be one. Um, uh, but whatever the case is, the more understanding you have, and, and if ever you're going to hire someone to do uh, to create the plugin for you, at least you have that good understanding if it's really going in the right direction or not. Right. That, uh, and one final thing on that: um, you don't need to learn PHP or anything if you just need a blog. Okay, just install WordPress. All you need are basic computer skills. But if you want to modify your blog, like you know, change the theme or do your own styles and everything. Or as Bench mentioned, you want to add some functionalities to WordPress. You would need then to learn PHP to create plugins and themes for you. All right, back to you, Bench. Okay, Kiko. Kiko has a question. Uh, I think. Oh, it's not a question. Uh, it's a statement. 
<laughs> I think it would be better if you started out a separate CSS file to introduce uh, the audience to the semantic markup. Uh, actually, what's going to happen is we scheduled out the days, uh, and we don't want to have consecutive days that would be all PHP, consecutive days that would be all HTML, consecutive days. We want to space it all out. So uh, from in the coming sessions, week after week, uh, we may have some HTML sessions, we may have some CSS sessions, we have some uh, PHP sessions, some MySQL sessions. So at least you get a good um, uh, feeling of each one, and you don't get overburned with a single topic for several uh, weeks. Uh, and and in the beginning, since this is the first one, we want to show out the relationship of the four before you know going deeper into each one individually. All right, and I do I do agree with Peek on that. Um, it's actually way better to do separate uh, files for CSS and JavaScript in each of them. But again, just for the purposes of the demo, we just uh, decided to put them all in one file. Okay. Uh, is it optimized to you? Uh, yes, from Adonis again. Is it uh, optimized to use CMS or build from scratch? Uh, I think the, the best way, I think John already answered that earlier, but uh, mm -hmm. let me just reiterate. Yeah. The thing is um, to build your own CMS is good. I've been down that road True. before. Um, I've built various CMSs for different clients already, um, and most of the time they are just you know for custom jobs. Okay, but nowadays if you're just putting up a website or even a functional like you know even Colder Scout runs on WordPress, I know we could actually do a lot of different things with that. So it's really up to you. But um, I would suggest if you're starting out, start with a functional uh, CMS like WordPress, then learn from there. Uh, there's another good question. I like this question from, from Ryan uh, Dingle. As the PHP code right now is on your demo, is the same uh, uh, with other PHP frameworks such as uh, YII, CodeIgniter, Zen, etc.? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, well, truth be told, I, I'm not really a big fan of frameworks. <laughs> PHP frameworks, Bench could attest to that. I yeah. tend to write my own frameworks. <laughs> and um, this, this uh, demo does not use any framework at all. So it's just, you know, start from plain, my, just my own thing. It's just, you know, one file for each thing. It doesn't need to do, actually, it's not that complex to actually require any frameworks at all. OK. Um, I'm just going through some are statements, not questions. I'm mm -hmm. uh, some are showing their appreciation. Thank you very much. I'm yeah, just yeah. scanning through. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Looks like we are not seeing any more questions come in. So perhaps um, Bench or John would like to add anything to what has been on. I have a question for you since there's some time here. You're, you're not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I'm going to throw you a meatball. No, we've talked, about this. we've talked about this before, but and you've kind of explained it to me, but for someone out there who's making that decision between should I code in straight PHP or should I use a uh, one of the PHP frameworks out there, we've talked about this before. Like you said, you're not, you're not really too keen on frameworks. Can you explain why, like exactly why that is? Okay, that's a good question. Um, thing is, most frameworks are designed to accommodate every possible scenario in developing a website. So in the end, you tend to have a bloated website with lots of different functionalities that you don't uh, necessarily need. Of course, there are frameworks out there that are better than the others, and um, I've used Cake, I've used CodeIgniter, but in the end, I just like to, probably it's more of a preference for me, plus the fact that I just hate, um, you know, bloated code. Most of the time, the framework, using a framework, I would come up with an application, it would generate the final code and everything, but then I would just have to edit it so much that I'd rather just start from scratch. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's practically why. <laughs> um, probably uh, one thing, you know, uh, some of you that, that have not been, uh, who are st just learning now and are starting out with a framework, uh, and those that are starting out or has some programming background, uh, and if you have been doing this over time, 
there, there's going to be some time where you have lots of snippets of code from various works that you've done, whether it's a function, a class, or uh, probably I'm not going to define that now, but you could just imagine that you have portions of code that are already saved, although you're not using a framework where the, the purpose of the framework is to get the work done fast. Right. Um, but if you have these, these pieces of code that you already have from your previous work, you just pull them all together, and sometimes you could still relatively come up with a with something relatively quickly. That's a great point. I advise people all the time on, on learnphp.co, like when I'm doing courses, that all you have to do is figure out something once, and then mm -hmm. once you figure it out once, you can lock it into code and you save it somewhere, and you kind of start to build your own, I call it a code base, you could call it kind of a ad hoc Library. framework or a mm -hmm. library, whatever the case may be, but you reach, you, over time, it, coding gets easier and easier and easier because you've figured out all of these things that you want to do and you've already written the code, you have it stored away, and so when you need it, you just kind of pull it out and use it. So that's a very great point if you're starting out. Start that process now uh, because it very quickly you can build up that library and, and <laughs> your coding gets a heck of a lot easier then. Uh, there are several, okay, go ahead. A good example of that, is what John just mentioned, is that Wishes Member itself, when we started it out, so I, I wrote everything from scratch. I had everything in there that does common things. Um, it's like, you know, do the activation, get information, or grab uh, option, options from the database and stuff like that. Um, then uh, when we decided to make more plugins under the Wishlist Products um, banner, we just decided to use old code from Wishlist Member cleaned it up and created our own, um, which we got actually call the framework, which we call Wishlist Skeleton. It's not released, of course, it's just for us. But every time we create a new plugin, we start from that framework that we already created. So in, this, in essence, yeah, we're still using a framework, but not just, just not one of those um, out there that, uh, that are more common to, for us to hear. Okay, we have probably 16 more minutes, and there's several questions that came in already. Uh, and I'll start with this first one, although it's not uh, a subject related, but it does say uh, when is the next next PHP training. So probably you want to flash that on your screen, Mike. Okay. Uh, Judith, let me just. Or, pro, or um, da -da -da, there you go. And I think right. when I speak, it's going to disappear, right? Um, let me double check. Oh, no, I, I'm not sharing my screen, so it's still your screen. Yeah, it should be okay. Anyway, I'll, I'll say, um, the, the first, the webinar recording, this actual webinar is being recorded, and we're going to repost this on the site on uh, February 22, 2013, this year, of course, not next year. And um, we were, are going to send you the link again via email, and we're also going to promote more of that, or sorry, uh, inform people about that more uh, during this week. The next free webinar will be on uh, March 1st, okay, and that would actually be handled by our good guy here, Bench, and he's going to be talking about uh, design uh, in terms of CSS okay. and stuff like that. Okay, so more questions that came in. Maybe this could be like a lightning round for the 15 minutes and get uh, as many questions through as much as possible. Sure. So here is one from John Albin Dimla, uh, which is more advisable to use encrypted PHP framework or create your own framework? Uh, your answer before was more of a preference, but if ever you would advise, what would be your advice? Okay. Um if you're starting out and you just want to get 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 a project done really fast, yeah, go ahead with a framework. Um, no problem with that. And you would still require the necessary things with the, you know all the necessary knowledge for PHP and stuff. But a framework would make it a lot easier for you to finish your project. Okay, Adonis wants to clarify something. What's the difference between flame frameworks and CMS? Okay, framework is pretty much you know uh, a set of code, as what John was saying earlier, a code base. That, um, that is used to easily create an application or a web application or a website, okay? It's used to create something. A CMS, on the other hand, is uh, CMS actually defined as content management system, is already a working system, okay? It's probably built on a framework like WordPress. So, um, it, and it is used to change, it's used basically to manage content on the website, not the, not the program itself, like, you know, creating posts, updates, news, and stuff like that. Probably from a from a point of view of experience, 
if it's a CMS, most probably you have a login page and you have buttons that you could click on if you want to post something and edit something. Right. And then a framework, you don't have any of that. <laughs> you yeah. just have a bunch of code. <laughs> um, yeah, if you use a framework by default, it's not going to do anything. Yeah. Whereas with the like a CMS, it's actually an application that already does something. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, Kiko has another question. Why does other companies use .NET than PHP? Is there a security issue? Um, yeah, this has been a question that has been revolving all throughout the web ever since I got started. People are saying that PHP is insecure because um, it's open source and that .NET <laughs> is more secure because it's closed source, okay? Thing is that in terms of security, it doesn't matter what scripting language you're using. If you code bad, I mean, I could write a really bad code in .NET, and um, it would still be insecure. And I could write a really good code in PHP, and actually vice versa. So security is more on how you code, but I think the language itself is not, I don't think that .NET is better than PHP, or PHP is better than .NET in terms of security. Yes. Yeah, and can I sure. add to that too, because I get that a lot too, and I think the the big thing to understand about you 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 will see like bigger companies using .NET or whatever the case may be. That's more of a a business decision than it is based on the code. And that's because when you have uh, again ASP.NET, I think is different than .NET. But when when you have Microsoft and you have you know their their code that they've released, they support that, and so you get bigger companies that want to work with a company that is going to support what they have. They have text, they have all, all these different things that they can provide to these big organizations who can pay for it uh, that allows them to write their code. Whereas with PHP being that it's open source, it's community based, you don't kind of, you don't really have that formal structure for um, support that you would have with something like that's backed by like Microsoft or some other big company that releases something. So a lot of the reason why people, why those bigger companies choose one of the other languages over PHP is for that reason, more of a, a business decision than because, you know, that language is better than PHP or whatever the case may be. I agree. Said it better. Uh, okay, more questions. If you want to build a website, I can just focus in HTML and CSS and use plugins in WordPress to make my site more interactive? Um, yes and no. It, it, it really depends on um, what kind of changes do you want to do. If you're just focusing on the appearance of, of stuff on, um, on WordPress, like you want to change the theme, yeah, I would say that HTML and CSS would suffice. Some knowledge in JavaScript would probably help. But if you want to change some functionalities in the theme itself, then you would still require, uh, you would still need to learn PHP, probably even MySQL. Okay, Anne is asking if you could give away your libraries. <laughs> if I could give away my libraries. I have to think about that. I wrote it like over, the ten, over 10 years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, Joomla is a great, is great with components and plugins, but perform sometimes. But performance sometimes suffers. Is that correct to say? Okay, uh, I'm not a proponent of WordPress or Joomla or Drupal for that matter. But um, I've had experience with Joomla way before when it was still Mambo, before they actually split up into Mambo and Joomla. So old, old, old. and lots of code that has to be processed and so on and so forth, there's going to be a lag in performance versus something like just doing a straight uh, HTML file or whatever the case may be. So uh, like you said, it comes down to the plugins and things that are installed, the theme that's being used, and of course the code itself uh, that's actually written. But in any of those situations, no matter which one you use, you're going to have to get yourself involved with things like caching and so on and so forth. To, to help do that. So that's one of the reasons I, I actually like WordPress over the others because that was my experience when I used them again a while ago was that WordPress just seemed to perform a little better than, than the others, but um, you know, that's just my very limited experience. So, uh, One thing I also want to add, sometimes if, if there's a large selection of, of plugins, extensions, add-ons, modules, uh, uh, different CMSs call them differently. Joomla likes 
calling them extensions. WordPress likes calling them plugins. But if you're trying to select which one is probably the best because some perform better than others, I would say just test them. And then aside from that, look at look at the star ratings, look at the reviews of others. And if ever there are some that are, are good, uh, have good reviews, then probably that is the first one to start with and test out. Okay, I think we have Mike back. Yep, sorry about that. Yep, no problem. I oh, we have your dog back too. <laughs> yeah. Get a dog. Okay. What is the advantage of normal procedural or PHP code than other built frameworks? Normal? Well, I... oh. <laughs> go ahead, Benji. I think. I... Yeah. Well, I think we have just gone through the question already of differentiating the frameworks and 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 just the plain PHP code. But I guess. Uh, kind of summarizing everything that Mike has said earlier. Uh, if you want it fast, you want it now, then you could start with uh, uh, a framework. Uh, if you don't want bloated code, you want it and you're doing a simple task and then you don't need much features, then probably it's even faster to just make it in straight PHP. All right. Uh -huh. All right. What path would you recommend to learn PHP for beginners? Just oh. continue with the weeks. Continue with the weeks moving forward. <laughs> yeah, that's one. Yeah, just keep on uh, staying tuned for, for all our upcoming webinars. Um, we will be posting more about this in our related podcasts and you know, stuff like that. Um, more stuff on the blog as well. But uh, if you still want to learn faster than, than our current pace, um, I would always advise, um, you know, Searching Google, that's what most developers do. Um, there are lots of instructions out there. There are lots of tutorials out there that would help you get started really fast. But then it still depends on what kind of knowledge you already have at hand. So, yeah. yeah Maybe like, you could already mention John's website also. Yeah, I, would, I, would, uh, I was about to say that. I just did. Uh, <laughs> I, was mention, I was thinking about that earlier when I mentioned the code is called. So yeah, you could also go to learnphp.co. They do have lots of videos there on different things on PHP, like you know, creating functions and classes and different stuff. John yeah. is a really good guy in terms of creating videos like that. He's the <laughs> video guy. Yeah, and I would say just one thing, like kind of what inspired that a little bit was what, what this is, is that um, I noticed that with my personal experience and people I've been through when I was learning PHP, it's like there was two different worlds that I lived in in that process. The first one was when I was trying to get my head around. That's why I really liked the idea for this webinar because as a beginning coder, I was trying to get my head around what PHP even was, what HTML was, what it does, how it all worked, like all the questions that we're talking about here. And, you know, when you don't have that understanding, when you don't have that over con broad conceptual understanding of how all these things work together and what PHP can and can't do, uh, it's very difficult to really get anything done because you don't really know what it is that you're doing. You know, if I do, I knew if I do this, this will happen, but that was about it. And then the other world is when you reach a point where it all kind of snaps together and then you understand it and suddenly everything else starts making sense. You can read the manual and it actually makes sense to you. Uh, mm -hmm. you, can, you can look at tutorials and they make sense to you. So my advice for learning a path for learning PHP is if you're in that first section, don't get too stressed out and caught up about the fact that you don't necessarily get it. Keep doing what you're doing and you'll reach a point where suddenly it'll all just click and suddenly everything else is going to fall into place and it'll start making sense and then it becomes just a matter of, from that point of, what do I want to learn how to do? What do I want to create? And so on and so forth. So focus on getting that broad conceptual understanding and getting it to click for you because then everything else is going to fall into place. Uh, one thing I also want to add, um, and I think I share the same experience with Mike since we've been starting out relatively the same time and also also learning in the s slightly the same way, which is learning by necessity. We just... Mm -hmm. Mm. Accept the project, not knowing how it's done, <laughs> but it's ne it's necessary because you have to you have to deliver. All, all you need to know is is it possible or not. And once you know it's possible, then you you continue with the research and you start just learning from there. I'm not advising that that's the best way to go, 
you know, sometimes you could get stuck up in a project and you you owe uh, everything's delayed and uh, it yeah. might cause some legal issues uh, <laughs> if if you don't deliver on time. But um, uh, sometimes if you, you you could you just get things done and you start learning quickly if it's really necessary. That's right. Um, I did mention that on on John's podcast. Like I think that was last week, John. Um, yep. Well, yeah, yeah. The thing is that sometimes you're forced to learn when you have things like that. And um, what, I, what I mentioned that I think I just want to share is that if, we, if you already know what you're doing, I mean, you, you actually know. I'm pretty sure you know what your capacity is, okay? All you need to do is just exceed that capacity by one step, okay? So if you could imagine it, then I'm probably sure that uh, you have a solution for that. It could, act, it could actually be, be, be accomplished. Yeah, and, and, and in terms of that, just, just keep on learning. Never stop learning. And I think that's the best path. Most people just get stumped, like, I can't understand this. I don't want to do this anymore. Keep learning. Keep learning. It's, you, you don't become a genius on your first day in school. You have to keep on staying, keep on learning before you become the pro. Okay, two minutes left. Uh, PHP and MySQL is a good combination. Oh, yeah. Very good combination. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very uh, good combination. Both are open source. Yep. Uh, I have a, a question regarding security since I'm more concerned about security matters. Can we protect our site using PHP alone? Can you? No. Okay, mm -hmm. PHP is not a security program. It is a programming language. It is a scripting language. Protection is more on the side of like, if you just want to protect your site alone using one solution, I don't think there's actually any one solution to that. But there are, those are mostly firewalls, keep on passwords protected. And, of course, in PHP itself, you just have to make sure that your code is um, secure, that you're not writing bad code. Um, uh, questions? Uh, you're, you guys are great. Thank you for sharing your expertise. Can I invite you and FEU Makati to speak? about PHP. FEU Makati is basically a university. It's, uh, Makati is a city in the Philippines. It's in Metro Manila. Uh, so uh, I guess that's a question for Mike right now <laughs> since he's there. <laughs> Why? Can, can you come and John come over here to the Philippines? Anyway, yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to do that as long as there are donuts and Coke. That's all I need. <laughs> uh, I'd be happy to whenever I go on vacation. I think I'm coming to the Philippines back in December. So maybe sometime December. Let us know. Mm -hmm. uh, Anything else? On I question? think we have gone through all of it. Yep. There's there's one on here that I think it's it's an interesting question that, that we haven't asked yet because I know this is something that I really wondered about. Do you mind if I go ahead and? Yep. Go ahead. It's, uh, how much is your developer per hour rate? And he was mm -hmm. basically what he's looking for is what do you charge? Because to give him an idea of what he should charge, uh, because that's I mean that's a really I don't even to this day really know to be honest. I mean I know what they charge, but I have no idea if they're expensive, cheap. So what what do you guys uh, in terms of that? If even if you don't charge per like that, but what would you say? I mean, do you guys don't have any insight on that? <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> well, f I'll give my my personal insights. Um, first is uh, and and how how charges progress over time. When I was starting out, and you know, the, with the limited knowledge, uh, you, you tend to charge a little bit cheaper because you don't have any clients yet. You're still starting out. You're trying to make a name. Then you start getting clients because of that cheap price. That is your main come on for people to actually hire you. And then it the, it comes to reach a point wherein uh, you're getting too much projects. You want to decline some. You start pushing back. You can't meet the deadlines. And suddenly you're staying up late. You're doing too much work, and no, I don't want to do this anymore. And then, since the demand is high, you know, it's like economics. When you, you know the demand becomes higher, the price becomes higher. So that's when you increase your rates uh, because the demand for you specifically is higher. I, actually, I used to outsource work to Mike in the past, that's and right. he used to have a very cheap rate. And then suddenly he becomes this wishless member guy, and I can't oh. afford him anymore. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh. so true. Oh, one thing that I want to add to what Bench was saying, as uh, 
she mentioned like you, you you stay late at night and keep on working. One one other thing that actually happened to Bench because of accepting too many clients, I believe, was he actually ended up in a hospital one time. <laughs> yeah, that's so, true. Also, be careful with the rates. I mean, um, low rates are good, and uh, as Bench mentioned, it's good when you're starting out. But um, I think that it's you're if you think that you're actually already worthy for a higher rate, it depends, depends actually on, on what you could do, and how long you've been doing it. Everything just increases, you know. The better you become, uh, the higher, the higher the rate comes as well. And of course, the rates also differ per country. U.S. is definitely way more expensive than uh, in the Philippines. Well, and to give, I guess, to maybe just give a hard number because I'm sure someone's looking for it. I'm I'm on the e-lamps and my mine's on there, so anybody can go and look at what mine is. So I don't have a problem telling it. But right now, I charge fifty-five dollars an hour. That's my that's kind of my basic rate, and then depending on the project, I may raise that or may lower that. Now, I'll tell you, I have no idea if that's if I'm working cheap, if I'm working expensive, but that for me, that is the rate at which I say, you know what, I'm willing to put myself through what I got to put myself through to code this project for that much. Because for me, I used to work construction, I made $10 an hour out in the sun, sweating, so to be able to sit at a computer and write code and make $55 an hour. Um, Way better. People will pay it if you can prove that you're worth it. So people, I mean, people pay that, but uh, again, I have no idea if that's high, low, whatever the case might be. Uh, and I think the bottom line of what John and Mike said is if you are worth it, so once you are worth that price, then uh, I guess you could charge the price that that people perceive you your worth. Uh, if ever there's a disconnect of your worth and your price, then that's when people start complaining. Oh, this guy's too expensive because or this, you know. Or this guy's too cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah true. Yeah, you'll notice uh -huh. you'll notice the opposite of what they're talking about. If you're too cheap, you'll end up with too many jobs and you'll be overrun. If you're too expensive, mm -hmm. it'll go the opposite way. You'll start not getting as many jobs. So you kind of have to find that medium where. You get the the um, get what you want, but uh, at the same time, you're willing to work for that price. Still have time. Okay. Um, uh, there's more questions, and we are now at twelve or four. Probably for the others, we would just be looking at them, and once the video is posted, um, we could add some comments below for other questions. Uh, unle uh, or else we're going to go on forever. <laughs> and, um, although there's one question that I want to point out there is from John Alvin talking about the outlines of topics for the following seminars. We'll probably uh, come up with that outline and post it also so that uh, you get a good idea of what the coming weeks would be. And yes, that is correct. So before we wrap up today's webinar, we would like to thank once again our sponsors, Wishlist Member, Internet Marketing Inc., and LearnPHP.co. And once more, thank you very much to all of you guys for attending this webinar and for making this webinar a success. So we are going to release webinar recordings soon. And um, for more as well, for more free PHP trainings, I would like to advise you guys to please go to coderscult.com slash webinars and register there for free. We will be emailing you updates about the webinars and uh, of course the recordings as well. So I uh, guess that's it for today. Thank you very much and uh, to Bench and John, thank you for joining us in today's very, very awesome webinar. Visit coderscult.com and don't forget to follow us on Twitter. Goodbye.